A reaction that releases free energy is spontaneous and is exergonic, or energy releasing. Ener exergonic reactions have a negative delta G. One that absorbs free energy is non-spontaneous and has a positive delta G is endergonic, or energy consuming. <clears throat> so, if we consider a graph showing the Gibbs free energy of the reactants and the products for a spontaneous reaction, we see that the products down here have less Gibbs free energy than the, the starting reactants. The amount of energy that is released in this process is the change in Gibbs free energy or delta G. In an energonic reaction, the reactants have less potential energy than the products, and an investment of energy is required. Think about how a series of small amino acids can be built up into a large and complex protein. That reaction will absorb energy, at least locally, though somewhere the entropy of the universe is increased. In a closed, systems, in a closed system, reactions will eventually come to equilibrium, and at equilibrium, no more energy can be released. Our bodies, our cells, are not at equilibrium. We eat, we breathe, we drink, we sweat, we pee, and other things. We are open systems, and in every moment we are bringing in new material to keep our chemical reactions from reaching equilibrium. Equilibrium in a biological system literally means death. Stop breathing, stop eating, and what happens? In our cells, catabolic pathways have many steps with different enzymes and different intermediates that release free energy a little bit at a time. It's like a hydroelectric, hydroelectric plant system along a river with a series of different dams and turbines. Hopefully you already understand the basic premise behind a hydroelectric system. A dam works by allowing water to fall and turn a turbine. The turbine converts the force of the falling water into electricity. And you know all the things that electricity can do. If a hydroelectric system were closed, we might be able to get some work out of it so long as there is some potential energy that we can convert to kinetic energy. So at time point one on the left, some water spins and the turbine turns and the light bulb shines. At some point two, the water level is level all the way across. There's no potential energy left to exploit, and the turbine stops spinning. Lights out. To keep the system working, we have to open the system up. There has to be new material coming in, and somewhere for the water at the bottom to leave. This same sort of thing is happening with the catabolic pathways in our cells, only there are many, many small steps that occur to release the potential energy. If we close off the system at either end, either at the top or at the bottom, it will come to equilibrium. Lights out. Again, and because, as you recall, there are thousands of reactions occurring in each cell, each feeding into each other, once the system comes to equilibrium, the condition is permanent. Lights out. Forever. R.I.P. Transitioning back to adenosine triphosphate, better known as ATP, it is time for us to revisit why it is such an important molecule and the main source of energy in cells. First of all, what kind of work does the cell do? Mainly these three bulleted uh, types of work. Chemical reactions, we've seen. Transport, we've seen. Mechanical, we've seen a little bit, like the movement of flagella and cilia, or the action of actin and myosin to make muscles contract. I've told you how ATP drives all of these types of work, and now we're going to see how. The key is by energy coupling. This means we can make an endergonic process exergonic if we use ATP or similar molecules. The first part of energy coupling is this. ATP has adenine and ribose, like in RNA, 
and phosphates 1, 2, and 3, or alpha, beta, and gamma. When we add in water, when we hydrolyze that gamma phosphate group off, it releases a lot of energy. Delta G goes mad negative, and that gamma phosphate bonded to another molecule raises the energy available for work, G, quite a bit. We saw in the previous chapter how ATP can make the sodium-potassium pump change its shape and reinforce the concentration gradient. Now let's see another example. Glutamic acid is an amino acid with an acidic R group. Glutamine is also an amino acid, but with an extra amine group added to the R group. Cells can convert glutamic acid to glutamine by adding ammonia, NH3, though the change in free energy is positive 3.4 kilocalories per mole. This is an endergonic reaction. Not impossible, just an uphill battle. So how do cells do it? We can add a phosphate group to glutamic acid from ATP hydrolysis. Glutamic acid plus phosphate, what is called a phosphorylated intermediate, has a higher Gibbs free energy than glutamic acid alone. How much more? If we look at this third line here, there's an explanation. So just adding ammonia to glutamic acid requires an input of 3.4 kilocalories per mole. When we hydrolyze ATP, that reaction releases negative 7.3 kilocalories per mole. A little bit of subtraction down here gives us do, 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 do. the overall reaction producing glutamine via phosphorylated intermediate has a net change in Gibbs free energy of negative 3.9 kilocalories per mole. The reaction is now exergonic. Okay, here's another analogy for you. Rolling downhill is an exergonic process. This bicycle man is rolling downhill and may top out at, let's say, 50 kilometers per hour or about 30 miles an hour. What happens when the terrain goes in the opposite direction, by which I mean uphill? Will he be able to go 50 kilometers per hour uphill? Probably not, even if he's mad jacked. He doesn't have the energy to get going 50 kilometers per hour uphill unless... What if he had a sneaky gasoline engine tucked away in his bicycle? Could he get going 50 kilometers per hour uphill? You betcha. Even faster. In this analogy, the sneaky engine is that gamma phosphate group from ATP. That makes an uphill climb, energetically speaking, as easy as a downhill drop. Does it matter to the bicycle man if 50 kilometers per hour is uphill or downhill? If his speed suddenly drops to zero kilometers per hour, i.e. he crashes, will his injuries be any more severe in either case? Uh, the sought after answer here is no. A crash at 50 kilometers per hour has equal energy uphill or downhill. But let's just hope Bicycle Man is okay. As we'll see in chapters 9 and 10, ATP is enormously useful stuff, and we go through a lot of it. It has been estimated that our cells generate our body weight in ATP every day, though at any given time, we only contain fractions of a gram in our entire bodies. Incredible though it may seem, it is because we have an amazing recycling program that regenerates ATP through catabolism. To, the, to that, we can power all of our awesome anabolic pathways. Moving to the final portion of this chapter on metabolism and how cells manage to obey the laws of thermodynamics, let's hear more about enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts. A catalyst is a chemical that speeds up a reaction, but not consumed in the process. I describe them as molecular tools, and I stand by that. For example, a hammer is a piece of matter that greatly speeds up the nail and board reaction. The nail and board are consumed, or rather changed, to meet a functional need. The hammer is ready to pound another nail, having suffered little in the process. I mentioned sucrase in chapter 5, as the enzyme that breaks the disaccharide sucrose into glucose and fructose. Enzymes are usually, though not always, 
named after the molecule they act upon with the suffix ase. I promise that it isn't always this confusing, sucrose, sucrase. Just for some reason, we're starting with an enzyme with a carbohydrate for a substrate. Sometimes the function of the enzyme is added between the molecule and the ASE, as we'll see in the next chapter at the end of this chapter. So you could, if you were so inclined, add 15 milliliters of sucrose, which is a tablespoon, to a glass of water and give it a stir to hasten the dissolving. After a month or so, you could analyze it to find that some of the sucrose had hydrolyzed. Not very much, though. Or you could add the tiniest amounts of sucrase, just a few molecules of the enzyme, and within seconds, the sucrose would be rent asunder wholly into glucose and fructose. Enzymes can't do the impossible, but neither do they screw around. Back... In chapter 2, I told you that chemical reactions All the way back in chapter 2, I told you that chemical reactions occur because bonds, covalent, ionic or otherwise, break and form. This is still true. However, to make the process of bond restructuring occur even in spontaneous reactions, a small input of energy is usually required, which is called activation energy, or henceforth, E sub A. In many reactions, thermal energy, or just heating, can overcome this energy hurdle. Think about the tea bag again and how steeping tea in water near boiling makes the tea diffuse much more quickly than if we just left the tea bag in lukewarm water all day, which again, any Briton will tell you, is the wrong way to make tea. Consider this graph. Showing the progress of a reaction and the amount of free energy over the course of that reaction. As you can see, this is an exergonic, spontaneous reaction. Delta G, over here with this yellow arrow, is negative. To get the reaction going, though, we need to break the bonds between A and B and C and D in order to form the new bonds between A and C and B and D. The in-between stage, or the transition state, can't happen without an input of energy, shown here as E sub A. Here is a very similar graph, showing the free energies of reactants and products, and you should notice that the free energies of those molecules do not change. They cannot, because G is a physical property of a molecule. What enzymes do, as illustrated in this graph, is to lower the activation energy of a reaction. The black trace shows the reaction curve without enzyme, and the red trace the reaction with the enzyme. Imagine that we've brought Bicycle Man back, and he has a friend. They have the same starting point and the same ending point. But if you were the Bicycle Man's friend, and he offered you the choice of the red bike or the black bike, and no secret engines everywhere, no cheating, Bicycle Man, the choice is clear. The red bike will win because the course is easier because this initial climb is lower. Enzymes, our biological catalysts, work only on particular molecules. That molecule for any given enzyme is called the substrate. For sucrase, the substrate is sucrose. The enzyme binds to the substrate, and together they form the enzyme-substrate complex. The substrate binds in a very specific part of the enzyme called the active site. Just like in our hammer analogy, you could try hitting the nail with the claw of the hammer or the handle, but for best results, use the smooth, flat hammer face that seems perfectly suited to strike the head of the nail. This brings us to the induced fit model. Another tool that makes things that are difficult easier is a baseball glove. The substrates, I would propose, are a flying baseball and a hand. The reaction that is catalyzed is preventing a baseball from hitting the ground, in most cases. Enzymes, like the glove, usually move and are usually much bigger than the substrates that they bind. For a glove to catch a ball, the glove needs to hinge and fold around the ball as one who is never very good at this action 
can attest. The folding is the induced fit. So hopefully in this picture, you can look at it and see why I thought of a baseball glove. The substrate, as you can see, uh, practically becomes lost in the enzyme substrate complex. But note well that the enzyme does move to envelop the substrate and the enzyme changes shape. So enzymes bind substrates and then what? They lower the activation energy, but how? This can be done by any of the ways listed here. When the enzyme folds around the substrate, it might bend a critical bond. It might hold two substrates in close proximity to squeeze a molecule of water out of them and form a, blond, a bond. The amino acids within the active site might be enriched in carboxyl functional groups, making a little acidic pocket in the active site, or the enzyme may form a covalent bond with a substrate in some way. In the cell, substrate molecules like A, B, and C, D that we saw earlier may find the active site of the enzyme that I'll call A, B, C, D rearrangerase. The enzyme changes shape and the substrate molecules are held in the active site. The shape may change, may twist the substrates, strain the bonds in such a way that the activation energy hurdle is overcome. The transformation into AC and BD breaks the hold of ABCD rearrangerase, which then releases the AB and the AC and BD, and the enzyme returns to its original shape, ready to receive more AB and CD.